You're watching CNU, where you can learn everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care and feel confident doing it. Today I have an overview of malnutrition in the hospital for you. Let's get started. The World Health Organization defines malnutrition as deficiencies, excesses, or imbalances in a person's intake of energy and or nutrients. This includes overnutrition, such as overweight and obesity, and undernutrition, which involves an overall lack of essential nutrients that can occur at any body size. Overnutrition is a more widespread problem in the United States, with over 40% of the adult population considered to have obesity. Nevertheless, when it comes to those who are sick and hospitalized, undernutrition is a common occurrence that can have devastating consequences. Addressing undernutrition has therefore been an emphasis of research and policy for clinical nutrition and will therefore be the focal point of this video. From this point forward, malnutrition will be used to indicate undernutrition only. Malnutrition among sick and hospitalized patients isn't a modern concept. However, it wasn't brought to the forefront of conversation in the medical community until 1974, with the publication of The Skeleton in the Hospital Closet by Dr. Charles E. Butterworth. In this paper, Dr. Butterworth said, I suspect that one of the largest pockets of unrecognized malnutrition in America, and Canada too, exists not in rural slums or urban ghettos, but in the private rooms and wards of big city hospitals. He also described malnutrition as a common accompaniment to the stress of illness among hospitalized patients that's rooted in long-standing neglect of nutrition in medical education and in healthcare delivery systems. Since then, major steps have been taken to identify patients who are at risk of malnutrition, as well as those who already have it. In the 1980s, the Subjective Global Assessment was created. This tool uses data collected during the nutrition assessment to classify patients as either well-nourished, moderately malnourished, or severely malnourished, and is widely recognized as being both valid and reliable. Then in 1996, a mandate for nutrition screening was made by the Joint Commission, which is an organization that provides accreditation to hospitals in the United States. It requires that all hospitalized patients undergo a nutrition screening process within the first 24 hours of admission so that those who require specialized nutrition care will receive it. To streamline this process, the mandate was met with the production of a number of screening tools in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Examples include the Malnutrition Screening Tool in 1999, the Nutrition Risk Screening 2002 in 2002, the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool in 2003, and the Short Nutrition Assessment Questionnaire in 2005. Finally, in the 2010s we saw an expansion of malnutrition assessment and diagnostic tools. In 2012, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition came together to establish their own criteria to assess for and diagnose malnutrition. This was followed by a set of criteria published by the European Society of Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism in 2015. Then, both of these organizations came together with other leading clinical nutrition societies to create a third set of criteria called the Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition. This was done in 2018. All of this is to show the infrastructure that's now in place to catch malnutrition early on. When a patient presents to the hospital, screening for malnutrition occurs right away. Screening is the process to identify an individual who is malnourished or who is at risk for malnutrition to determine if a detailed nutrition assessment is indicated. 
Screening tools are meant to be quick and simple and are usually performed by the nursing staff in the first 24 hours of admission. Assessment is the comprehensive approach to defining nutrition status that uses medical, nutrition, and medication histories, physical examination, anthropometric measurements, and laboratory data. Compared to screening, assessment is a more in-depth process and is typically performed by a registered dietitian. If the patient meets the criteria for malnutrition that's specified in the assessment tool being used, then a formal diagnosis of malnutrition can be made. Even though there's a number of options available, medical institutions generally choose just one screening tool and one assessment tool to use. This way, there's consistency in the identification of malnutrition, the documentation of malnutrition in the electronic medical record, and the training of hospital staff. Identifying malnutrition early on and applying nutrition interventions is important because patients with malnutrition experience worse outcomes than patients without it. When inadequate energy and protein intake results in loss of muscle mass, it can lead to a significant decline in functional status, making it difficult for patients to get out of bed and perform daily activities like shopping for and preparing food. This serves as a barrier to discharging the patient home and increases the risk of pressure injuries. Malnutrition will also contribute to an impaired immune response and poor wound healing, which increases the risk of infection and delays recovery from surgery. Overall, compared to patients without malnutrition, patients with malnutrition experience a longer length of stay, are more likely to be readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of discharge, and are more likely to die of any cause while hospitalized. With these consequences in mind, we can see that malnutrition increases the resources needed to provide excellent patient care. Patients with malnutrition often require the provision of nutrition support and or oral nutritional supplements. Pressure injuries often require specialized wound care. Infections require additional medications like antibiotics and critical illness can require life-saving therapies like mechanical ventilation and hemodialysis. Providing a formal diagnosis of malnutrition and documenting it in the electronic medical record is necessary because it helps to address this cost. Hospitals receive a reimbursement for the care they provide, which is paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, a private insurance company, or by the patient themselves. The amount paid is based on a number of factors such as the principal diagnosis, any secondary diagnoses, and the base rate of the hospital, which is determined by things like the demographics of the patient population and the severity of illness at the facility. While malnutrition is not a common principal diagnosis, in many cases it can be added as a secondary diagnosis to the patient's stay. When there's appropriate documentation of it, it will lead to a higher reimbursement for the single admission. When this is done consistently, a hospital that has a lot of patients with malnutrition may see an increase in the base rate that's assigned to it. Even though most clinicians are more concerned with providing patient care than they are the finances of the hospital, contributing to reimbursement will help to ensure the hospital has the resources it needs to function. For nutrition professionals, diagnosing malnutrition is one of the only ways to demonstrate that their expertise adds value in the form of dollar signs. This should serve as an incentive for dietitians to master malnutrition assessment and diagnosis because it's a path to pay increases and or the hiring of additional staff members. The final section of this video is going to explore the current guidance from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. In recent years, there's been a push to establish more consistency with the screening and assessment tools that are used. 
This isn't just within one facility as was mentioned previously, but across all facilities to make diagnosis a more standardized practice in the profession. One reason for this is to simplify education, not only for nutrition students, but for clinicians of all disciplines who need to be aware of the presence, importance, and consequences of malnutrition in hospitals. Another reason for the standardization of malnutrition care is for research purposes. When different screening and assessment tools are used, it's more difficult to collect and analyze data, which in turn makes it more difficult to determine the prevalence of malnutrition and monitor the trends. In 2020, the Academy published a formal position paper that recommends the use of the malnutrition screening tool regardless of age, medical history, or setting. This tool was created by Ferguson et al. in 1999 and has since been validated in both acute and long-term settings. It's composed of three simple questions. Have you lost weight recently without trying? If yes, how much weight have you lost? And finally, have you been eating poorly because of a decreased appetite? The possible responses to each question have an associated score, and if the patient receives a total score of 2 or higher, then they're considered to be at risk of malnutrition and should undergo a full nutrition assessment. To complete the assessment for malnutrition and see if a formal diagnosis is warranted, the Academy recommends using the assessment tool they created with Aspen in 2012. This work established an etiology-based classification system, which means that it seeks to identify the cause of malnutrition, or at least the context in which it has occurred. When using it, the first step is to figure out which category the patient belongs in. Acute illness or injury, chronic disease, or social or environmental circumstances. Once the etiology is determined, then the information collected in the nutrition assessment can be compared to parameters set forth for six different clinical characteristics. Those characteristics are energy intake, weight loss, loss of subcutaneous fat, muscle loss, fluid accumulation, and reduced grip strength. If the patient satisfies the criteria that's outlined for at least two of the characteristics, then a formal diagnosis of malnutrition can be made. Malnutrition is classified as moderate or severe, depending on the objective and subjective information that's obtained during the assessment. Looking at the recommendations from the Academy from a bird's eye view, we can see that when a patient presents to the hospital, they should undergo nutrition screening using the malnutrition screening tool in the first 24 hours of their admission. If their score is less than 2, then they're not at risk of malnutrition, so no nutrition assessment is automatically necessary. But if their score is 2 or higher, then they are at risk of malnutrition and should therefore undergo a full nutrition assessment by a registered dietitian. As part of the assessment, consideration should be given to the malnutrition criteria that's outlined by the Academy and Aspen, starting with the etiology. Then the data collected should be compared to the parameters set forth for the six clinical characteristics. If the patient satisfies the criteria for at least two of those characteristics, then a formal diagnosis should be made, which contributes to the reimbursement for the hospital. In the next video, I'm going to spend more time digging into the Academy and Aspen Malnutrition Assessment Tool. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys there.